What's up, everybody? Welcome to another wealth webinar. And today we're going to talk about experiences. We're going to talk about cars and how you can get all the money back for every single one of those cars you ever buy, drive, and own. And we're going to talk about mechanics behind the infinite banking concept. We're going to teach you how to move your money like a bank does, how to beat inflation like all of us do, because money in motion is the key. If your money's constantly in motion, Inflation? What's that? That's what we're going to hit today. So I hope you guys are ready. We'll be right back. All right, Shauna, so where should we start? Um, I think we should recap the, the weekend, uh, the experience. I've got my Sundance hat on right now for this video. And um I think I gave Andrew some pictures too, if you want to show any pictures Absolutely. of this. Absolutely. So but. why don't you help kind of, I'll, I'll get the pictures up here so you guys mm -hmm. can see them. And then uh, let's, let's roll through and talk a little bit about what we just had and what we just did. Can you see the full screen? There we go. Yes. Much All better. right. Woo. Rolling. So we had three days um, jam-packed full of goodness. Um, I called it, I tried to speak in front of everybody in the beginning went horribly because I don't know how to breathe in front of a large crowd of people but luckily we do zoom um like every day so I'll be I'll be much better here in this atmosphere um I definitely think the best way to describe the experience is like an entrepreneurial Disneyland it is like a 16 hour day but there still just seems like there's not enough time in the day and we never want to go home so there's Sean who's on here who Irish goodbye me, who I like to think I'm the, I'm the queen of Irish goodbyes, but I never got a formal goodbye from you, Sean. <laughs> and then Debbie, pretty much, I think that yeah. sums up the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> so really, it was a really great time. Um, I mean, I cried like pretty much every single day. Uh, he was brought to tears between the speakers, just the interactions of everybody there. And um, none of us really wanted to go home at all. So, absolutely. <laughs> and you know, it was kind of funny. The thing, you know, we we put the event on, and you know, the whole team put an awful lot of energy behind it. Not first, you know, with selling it out, and then you know, just making sure that it was going to be exactly what the name is—an experience. I go to so many masterminds, and you know, some of them I love, some of them I love to hate. And some of them I just hate. The ones I don't like are the ones where you're in a room, just like a hotel room, and you're just listening to speaker after speaker after speaker. And they do these like little breaks where you're rushing and you start talking to people. And then all of a sudden you got to get ushered back in. And, you know, that's what I didn't want this one to be. So we left a whole lot of free time. We made lunches extremely long. Most people probably didn't even realize the lunch was like double the time that a normal lunch would be. But we did that so that people could really connect network and build relationships. And then we focused the whole experience around one thing and one thing only. And that was solving someone else's problem. So we kicked off the day with a terrible reading exercise performed by me, where I read off everybody's notes in terms of what they wanted to get out of the experience. And each and every single person in that room from day one, from the first hour, knew what the other people needed to get so that they could just focus on that the entire time. And then uh, that's all that happened. But we focused on it by, you know, spending time together in this awesome looking place over at Sundance. We spent one whole day zip lining, snowboarding, skiing, glass blowing, and just doing all of that. And the coolest part was Shauna, there wasn't a moment during the entire experience where there wasn't people together chatting. I mean, a lot of it was done at this place called the Owl. I think we pretty much took over the Owl three days in a row. And the Owl is a little bar that Billy, part of the bar was actually shipped in a long time ago from Wyoming. And it's a bar that Billy the kid used to hang out at. So it had a lot of cool stories. They had a, a good drink menu and a really good uh, bar menu. So uh, everything was super fun. And a lot of people made a lot of connections. I heard some of the stories. It, it was wild. And then Shauna, talk a little bit about some of the speakers that we had, because we had some crazy things happen that weren't in the plan, but the universe allowed to happen. Yeah, um, we had obviously a solid rock star um, lineup that we knew about. And then as we were there, like Chris said, um, things just started happening one after the other and really awesome people were able to just kind of show up um, 
just because they felt like they were called to uh we had we obviously had kelly there who is he was there the entire time that every attendee was um you know we had some speakers just kind of pop in and pop out some people who we we didn't even really know who just came and brought a lot of heat to a lot of heat to the whole event and then um we had Dan Clark show up, who was really amazing. And I think um, Chris did FaceTime or fa Facebook Live it. So there should be a little bit of that on the Facebook. But um, it, it was really powerful. Uh, a lot of people were, you know, were brought to tears. A lot of people were able to just you know, shake hands with people that they normally would just see from stage. And it was really awesome. Yeah, and you know, the gentleman on the screen that you're looking at, his name's Dan Clark. I met him back in 2014, and if you just Google Dan Clark, you will understand the caliber of this speaker. He wasn't part of the speaker roster, but when Kelly and Jay uh, showed up, they actually met up with Dan at the airport. Dan gave him a ride, and Dan asked him, what are you guys in town for? And they said they were doing you know, the mastermind with me, and Dan's like, wow, that's amazing. You know, let me know if he needs anything. And I think one of them said, you, you know, you should come in and, you know, hang out and maybe speak. And I text him immediately when Kelly and Jay told me and let him know that, you know, I'd love to have him speak. And sure enough, he comes up right before his dentist appointment and puts on just the most amazing speech. Now, for those of you that don't know Dan Clark, he's one of the world's just, he's just, I would call him the world's best speaker. He is phenomenal in a way I can't put words to it. He's, he has spoken for the military hundreds of times for presidents. I mean, you name it, he's spoken. I think he's done, I don't know, 700 to 1,000 speeches in his professional career. So he's a, a massive, massive influence in the speaker world and uh, ex-pro football player, if I'm not mistaken, just accolades that go on forever. But he, he put on just the most amazing presentation day two and uh, couldn't be more thankful that he actually showed up. And then there's lots of this going on, uh, lots of just people talking. That's Devin and Chris Bizov with Lee in the background. Uh, we kept the event small. 25 is the max amount uh, that we allow in it. And uh, we just kept rolling. This was the third day. So you got the people zip lining here in line to jump on one of the, is it the longest zip line in the U.S.? It's like close to one of the longest zip lines in the U.S. Yeah. It, it, uh, it freaks some people out. Some people are afraid of heights. So when you get up there and you're looking down, I don't know how far the drop is like once you go, but the line just goes out of sight and you can't even see it. And you're just like, wait, is that where we stop? And they're like, nope, you got to go over the, you got to go over those trees, over the yurt, over the parking lot. And then <laughs> you end up there and we're just like, wait, where is there? And they're like, we well, can't really see it. It's, it's way over there. It, yeah. They have to radio um, in when people are actually to the, to the end so that other people can get on it. Yeah, it's, uh, it was forever. I mean, you're on it and you just felt like it was never going to end. And you're going about 60 miles an hour if you, you pulled the thing all the way down. And then yeah, we spent it some was time. A, it was a really good um, example, though, of everything we learned that weekend is um, I know that for me personally, when I was hooked up there and like you have to kind of pull down to start your to start your I don't know what you want to call that your zip. And so you're in control of basically setting yourself to go and I know that for me the first couple seconds I you know half hesitated and then at that point you just have to kind of go all in which is really what that whole weekend was about is there is always going to be that little hesitation in the beginning but you just got to kind of you got to go all in and send it because that's just the way everything works in life including your business and a literal zip line <laughs> and snowboarding for sure you know with the jump when you get there you know everybody was like kind of just expecting me to just roll off the jump and you know thank god chris bizub was there with me because normally i like to check a jump out like i get to a place i look at the jump i usually roll over the top to figure out how long it is how fast i gotta go and there's everybody watching because like oh here's the park and chris used to be a pro snowboarder so let's see what he's gonna do is he gonna do like you know sean white stuff and um so there was no you know there was no rolling over the jump chris bizub just goes and takes it, sends it deep. And that was the beginning of uh, that, uh, follow the leader and just send it. And that's a, that's a photo right there of us out snowboarding. I did manage to take Devin out. He was running away from me like a little baby, but I caught his ass and I took him down and we did it on film, but we missed the most important part. If you follow the TikTok video of it, you'll see my journey. It took almost the entire run for me to catch him and get 
get behind him and just yank him down. And we were both on TikTok. And right as I went to pull him off, my finger slipped off the button as we went down and tumbled. But uh, that was the shot from the day that I took him down. Steven was straight out of the 90s. <laughs> Any of you uh, know snowboarding? Like this is a full up 1990s JP Walker style outfit. So we were pretty pumped about that because he brought back some amazing memories in that one. And just another shot from the top of one of the, the peaks. We actually ended up going up to the very top, which I believe is 12 or 13,000 feet. So you got some fun stuff going on there. Chris Bizub, that's at the very top there. You can see the lakes behind us. That's the peak of it. And you can, you can notice we're not in jackets because it was like 40 degrees and sunny up there. It was, it was spectacular. And uh, with that being said, let me edit and come out of that and stop sharing here real quick. But uh, that, was, uh, that was the experience. It was magical. Uh, words don't do it justice. I mean, if you're reading the comments, I'm sure some of the people that are there are doing a much better job of telling you a little bit better uh, what it was like, what that experience was. Uh, we all came back a little bit tired, not going to lie. Lots of delays in flights and good stuff, but uh, worth every moment of it. And just uh, on that, Shauna, just we've got a couple other things. Um, I saw that there was a comment about Secret Knox. So I'm back on a plane. Me and some of our staff here is, are back on a plane to speak at Secret Knock. And Catherine said she has two Secret Knock tickets available. It is a sold out event, folks. So she has two available um, at an appropriate time. Not sure what that means. Tia says she just needs a name and an email of the person. So if any of you are in California or somewhere close and you want to go to the event, Secret Knock, a fully sold out event, uh, I'll be speaking from stage, then speaking at a dinner. So it's going to be a, a great time. But if you guys want, chat in or send in the Q&A section, which would probably be better, your name, email, and phone, and we'll get it over to Catherine. And then outside of that, just you get the events out of the way. We do have our next mastermind, our next experience. For those of you that didn't join us in Sundance, we have our next one going on in Wyoming. We've already got about 20 seats sold. Now, Wyoming, we're going to basically be able to hold some more people because it's going to also not just be the next experience. It's going to be the actual launch, the full United States launch of Private Money Club. So we're going to be launching the brand new, like, done platform that we're spending $300,000 on for Private Money Club. We're launching it in Wyoming, October 6th, 7th, and 8th. If you want in on that one, it will sell out. I promise you, we're already halfway there. We're going to, I think, open up 40 seats at that one, and not, not one more than that. It's going to be at Randy Garn's place. He's got a, a trout, like it's like a trout farm, but it's basically just natural ponds that cascade down. We're going to be doing skeet shooting. We're going to be doing horseback riding, spending time at an equestrian. We're going to be doing the private money club launch. Uh, what else are we going to be doing? There's going to be all sorts of other activities. And it's going to be done, done at Randy Garn's place out there in Wyoming. So if you guys want in on that, it's October 6th, 7th, and 8th. You can go to the link, which Shauna will put up, and you can register or send us a DM. And then we can. Yeah, I'm, I'm for now, because I actually text Randy's assistant today, because I don't know exactly how many um, we're going to be able to hold. So rather than, you know, having you check out through the link, I'm going to say, um, how about you email me if you're serious about it, and we'll get you on a list. And I can, uh, once I get the okay of how many people are able to come, I'll start, you know, taking payments and get it, get it figured out. But I'll have you guys email me. I put it in the chat, Shauna, S-H-A-W-N-A -A, at chrisnoggle.com. And then we'll get you going there. Because like Chris said, a lot of the people who attend the experiences, they, you know, are touched and they, and they want to come they want to come back. So um, those of you experiencing FOMO, you know, you got to get on the list. <laughs> <laughs> FOMO. Perfect. Yes. Uh, and uh, this will definitely be probably one of the best experiences we ever do, primarily because of where we're doing it. I mean, if any of you have ever been to Jackson Hole, someone was just asking about that. I mean, first off, the airport's the sickest airport I've ever been to. I, I was told that the there's an airport in Hawaii that's prettier than Jackson Hole, but that's probably the only other one. Jackson Hole Airport is, is spectacular. You stare out giant windows at the Teton uh, mountain range. And then not only that, we are going to bus over to the event, which is just past Jackson Hole. I think it's about 40 minutes outside of Jackson Hole, uh, kind of in the middle of nowhere, but we take over an entire town. We book out all their hotels. There's only one bar in the entire town, and we run it for three days. If you are, are into bars, if not, there's plenty of other stuff to do, but uh, the bars seem to be a, a hot spot 
for the last experience. So I'm just going off of that. So yeah, we don't know how many total people I misspoke by saying 40. So once we get the total number, maybe it's 25. And if that's the case, well, there's five left. But get on that. Don't wait. Don't you know ponder that one. It's October 6th, 7th, and 8th. Plenty of time to plan. Plenty of, plenty of time to set up a payment plan. Cost is $49.97. Or if you're bringing somebody, you can do the $49.97. Or I think it's buy one at $49.97 and then get the, the guest half off. So we are still maintaining that. So that's that. And the only other events that we have that I'll make mention, if you guys are taking notes since we're on the flow of this, we've got our mastermind for the money multiplier. It's a $97 ticket. It's in Daytona Beach. The first night is going to be at Brent Kessler's house. And then after that, we're going to go to an awesome hotel right on the water. And we're going to do a mastermind. And that mastermind, just so you're clear, so we don't uh, screw up the expectations of it, that mastermind is just the infinite banking concept. It is the only thing that will be talked about there. We will not be talking about anything other than the infinite banking concept, advanced strategies. It is for people that are just getting into the infinite banking concept to people that have been doing it for a decade and just looking to know how else can I use this? We've got so much planned for that. So that one's going to be in, uh, is that May, Shauna? Yeah, Hannah's event is May 5th, um, which is just a dinner that night. And then the 6th and 7th is in the hotel. Um, And I definitely want to bring up our next virtual three day coming up April 1st, 2nd and 3rd. Um, There's only three of those events in this year left. And that the April one is the is the next one. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to be, you're going to be hearing a lot about that. Our, our marketing is going to be solely focused on the next virtual three-day event. Uh, if you didn't make the last one, or even if you did, you realize the power of that event. So you're not going to want to miss that, but that one's virtual. You can do that in your underwear or sweatpants from your living room, kitchen, bathroom, or sauna, whatever you prefer, but careful on those saunas, laptops and phones do not like them. So right there's the registration link. Uh, Catherine, we do have, I can't remember how many we have left. I think we have 10 spots left on 25, 25, 25. Again, email Shauna if you're interested in getting in on the 25, 25, 25. We are ready for that. We do have the the legal documents to sign that up. So we're ready to rock and roll. And uh, yeah, so let's dive in. So today, Shauna, we're going to talk cars. We're going to talk infinite banking. And I really want to talk, we didn't have this in the plan, but I want to talk a little bit about inflation again. Because not just inflation, but a misconception. There's so much. We, we have a, if you guys aren't in this yet, we have a Facebook group. It's just called the Infinite Banking Facebook group. And you can see it's like a little black icon. And uh, we get questions every day, hundreds of questions a month, all about things that we talk about on this wealth webinar all the time, but people seem to miss. Things like, you know, I can't seem to make sense of the numbers in this infinite banking thing. And that's because people are focusing on the wrong things. They're focusing on number one, the rate. So they're like, well, who pays? I I get this one all the time. Who pays the highest dividend? And you know what I want to say? So me being the asshole that I can be, I want to say the rate doesn't effing matter. The dividend doesn't matter. You're screwing it up and you're not even understanding how this works because people are treating it like an investment. They're treating it like I put my money in there. I just leave it. So the highest rate is going to give me the best performance. That is not true at all. And I will be the first to tell you that the highest dividend is definitely not always the best plan because it's not about a dividend. It's not about a rate at all. It's about how the concept works. It's about how the money moves, how you earn uninterrupted compound interest the entire time. So really, it's not about a rate. It's about a spread. So if you chase a rate, you're not going to get the biggest spread. But if you chase the spread and the compounding effect, then you really start to understand this. And the other, another thing a lot of people make mistakes, they hear it, they, they kind of don't get around the campfire, they haven't watched the 90 minute video and they're, they're trying to say, I've looked at numbers on an illustration because they go to one of our competitors, not going to use their name, and that, that competitor just gives them this illustration, like that's all this is. Here's an illustration, great, buy a policy from us, great, then everything's going to be good. No. It's not going to be good because you're just buying a whole life policy that is designed the right way, but that isn't the name of the game. The name of the game is what you do next. Matter of fact, you know who the loser in the infinite banking game is? Can anyone tell me? I want to hear this. Anybody that's that's listening, who is the biggest loser in the infinite banking concept? Can anyone tell me? Well, (laughs) good answer, Brian, but that's not the one I'm looking for. (laughs) Said banks. Who's the biggest loser? No. There you go. Dustin nailed it. I wish, actually, I got to give Dustin some. Hold on, hold on. We got to go back. You guys are all <laughs> yeah. good, but Dustin got it right on the nose. 
those so we're, we're wow a lot of them came in i i can't he said uh, the the one who doesn't use it so dustin was the first that said that um and then carl said the same thing the biggest loser in the infinite banking concept is the person with the most amount of money in their policy at the end that's it if you do the infinite banking concept and you put money into this stupid whole life because that's what i'm going to call it i'm just going to call it a stupid whole life because if you think of it as a whole life you're, you're already lost it's a machine it's a machine. We put money in and we move that money out. So if we, our game, if the number one, if the winner of the game is the person that has no money or very little money left in the machine, then you are looking at this all wrong. If you're looking at rate and you're looking at this all wrong, if you think having the most amount of money in the policy is the winner, it is not. You put money through this machine, which just is a specially designed and engineered whole life. Very different than the whole life your bro broke ass brother-in-law sells you. The next game or next part of this concept, I'm going to call it the game, is to find a place for that money to go work for you, which is law number two of wealth. Your money must work for you to find a place for that money to go where it will work for you and the spread works in your favor. In other words, if and we'll just hypothetically, if you're making five and I'm just throwing a number out, you know, you're going to make between five and six percent with dividends. If you're making five and you're paying four, in the first year, your gross spread is one. But in year two, in year three, in year four, in year five, your money continues to compound and go up and your rate to borrow that money never changes. So your spread automatically goes up. Do you see why the rate isn't the most important thing? What the pr important part is, is what do you do with the money? And that's what we want to talk about today. We're going to talk about cars, but you could pay off credit card debt. You can invest in real estate. You could make private loans. You could buy crypto if that so suits your fancy you could lend money to your company for marketing or for copy machines or you could lend money to your company for buying real estate or doing anything you want you see it's what the money does after it moves through the machine that matters folks and until you understand that everything else everything else is a complete utter waste of your time and our time if you're asking the question will always give you answers but i'm just being clear that the concept is not about how much money you put in the whole life the, the concept is about taking back the banking functions in your life. So that means instead of buying cars and leasing or financing them through the traditional bank, you lease and buy cars through your bank. Instead of buying real estate, borrowing money from Bank of America or a community bank, you buy real estate using your bank. Instead of borrowing money from private lenders to fund your rehab, you borrow money from your bank and lend it to your company. See, I'm getting deep into this. And for those of you that are this, you're new to this, this might not make sense. But what if I told you that no matter what you ever buy for the rest of your life, cars, boats, copy machines, planes, trains, you name it, whatever you buy, what if I told you that no matter what, you will always get every single dollar back for all the things you buy, drive, fly, and own? Would that be enough to get your attention? Because if it's not, then I have no idea what gets you, gets you excited because that should get everyone excited. Because each, each month, if all of you look at the amount of money you're giving away, look at your car payment, look at the amount you write to the credit card companies, Look at all those things every single month. Look at that and add it up. Just to remind yourself, just think about it and remind yourself how much money leaves your family each and every single month and goes to someone else's bank. And then once you figure that out, and it's probably a big number, once you figure that out, then go back and re-engineer it and figure out how much of that money that just left your family forever was interest. That interest is funding somebody else's car purchase, is funding somebody else's boat purchase, is funding somebody else's jet or lifestyle or whatever you want to call it. That's the way you need to think. The infinite banking concept, which was created by just a hero in all of our minds, R. Nelson Nash. If you, if you don't understand this concept, start with this place first. It's a book called Becoming Your Own Banker, written by R. Nelson Nash, the late R. Nelson Nash. He pioneered this concept. The book is a must. You cannot start this without reading that. It's like the Bible. Once you're done with that one and you want the more modern version, grab our book. We give them away for free. Just pay for shipping, mapping out the millionaire mystery. But I'm simply trying to help you understand the, the misconceptions about this and the reasons why you would want to do this. Because a lot of people, I think they start by just thinking that the magic in this whole great concept and this thing they keep hearing about is just to put money in a whole life. 
if that's where you stop, you have failed. Well, maybe you haven't failed because, you know, it's still better than being in a bank account. But to me, to Shauna, to anyone on this team, that is what we call failing. Okay. Uh, I don't know the terminology Ricky Bobby would use for, for coming in and last, but Ricky Bobby always said, son, if you're going to be first, you're going to be last. Or if you're going to be first, oh shit, I just screwed that up. You get the drift. You're either first or you're last. Wow, Sean is laughing at me. I say that every day and I never get it wrong. So right there on video, I screwed it up. If you're not first, you're last. And that's the name here. You want to be first and you want to be right on how you move your money. Anyway, if I could edit it, I'd be erase that whole part. But here we go. Let's let's dive in, Shauna. Let's talk cars. Do we have any questions that came through that we can hit while I'm pulling this up? Um, I think... Carl brought up something. He said, the one thing I don't understand is if you get to a point where all your money flows to the banking system first, and then you take out loans um, to pay for things, are you then paying the policy loan back with cash and not putting that money through the machine first? Sorry if that question doesn't make sense. But what he's saying is you take out a loan and yeah, you are kind of using the money that you make every day to kind of pay that back, correct? Yeah, but so... So Carl, let me, let me rephrase that question. Right now, when you go and buy a car, okay, and you, you finance it through a dealership, you're still making car payments, right? When you use a credit card to buy something, you're still making monthly payments to the credit card, correct? So in this system, what you're doing is you're just capitalizing your bank. That's the hardest part. First, you got to save money. It's law number one of wealth, folks. Law number one, before this is done, nothing else can do. Law number one says you must keep one-tenth of your gross income. In other words, you must save one-tenth of your gross income. All we're doing, folks, is we're following law number one. Keep one-tenth of your gross income. Then what we're doing is we're changing where that one-tenth goes first. That's all we're doing. One change, adding one step to your life, and we're changing where that money goes first. Instead of putting it in someone else's bank, where it's gonna earn next to nothing or nothing in, in most bank cases, you're gonna change where it goes and it's gonna go into your bank, which is nothing more than this specially designed and engineered whole life. So that's, that's the first step, change. Then what we're gonna do is we're then going to loan that money to ourselves or to somebody else to buy something. We're gonna talk cars, so let's just pick on cars. We loan that money to ourselves to go pay cash for a car. You already agreed that if you were to buy a car any other way, you would make a monthly payment. You'd make a lease payment or you'd make a car payment to one of the traditional banks, Wells Fargo, m and Bank, Bank of America. So that money would have already been leaving your family, right? So when you think about this, your capitalization of your banking system is nothing different than the money you're already saving today, Carl. It's not new money. It's money that you're already saving somewhere. We're not trying to just say, okay, you go out and you earn money and you put all your money through this policy. No, it's just the money that you save today, dollar for dollar, okay? So if you're already saving 10,000 a year, you just change where the 10,000 a year goes. If every month you look at your bank statement and you figure out this much money leaves and this much money stays in my bank, the amount that stays in your bank minus a reserve is the amount that goes over into this, that's all. Then we move that money out and we buy the things that we wanna buy. But if you were to buy the things you were normally going to buy, you would always have a monthly payment unless you paid cash for it. But that's even worse. OK, because I get this all the time, Carl. People say, yeah, but if I paid cash for it, I wouldn't have a monthly payment. No, it'd be worse if you paid cash for it. You literally just lost all that money because you bought a depreciating asset. In most cases, a car. I don't know about any of you. And, and let's get out of the last year where cars actually appreciated and, and get back to reality where cars don't appreciate, they depreciate. You put all your money into that car, which is a depreciating asset, and that car will never pay you a penny back outside of maybe a small portion when you resell the car. So that money is leaving your family forever. You lose the earning potential on that money and you bought yourself a depreciating asset. That's just looking at a car. So what we do is we, we, we change that. We just, instead of paying Bank of America or someone else, we save the money in our bank. We move it out to buy the car. When we buy the car, we just find out how much that car would have cost if we financed it through whoever the finance company is, GM, Ford, Mercedes, Maserati, doesn't matter. And we pay our bank the whole life back the exact same amount you would have paid the car dealership or the car finance company. It's the same dollars, Carl. There's, we're not creating new money. We're not taking on new expenses. We're simply saving the same amount we were saving, spending the same amount we were spending monthly, except for the thing that changes 
is whose bank gets all that principal in interest. In this equation, in the infinite banking concept, the bank is your bank. So hopefully that helps. Any other questions, Sean? No, um, but I'm gonna try. I'm I'm gonna try to do that whole like you just change where the money goes first. I the way I learn is by just associating it with something I already know in the world. So you don't have to think that the infinite banking concept and all of this is something completely new that you have to learn. I the way I was able to understand it the most was just by taking the concept to something I already understand. So, for example, when I was younger like 15, my aunt loved taking me to JC Penney's and she loved, and she, she never used a credit card. You know, she was never in debt, anything like that. And I remember standing at the counter where, you know, the person is trying to be like, well, if you open a credit card, you can save, you know, 5% or whatever. And she's just like, well, why would I open a credit card? I have the cash right here. Like, why do I need that? And uh, well, the, and then, you know, and then the lady's like, well, you can use the credit card for this perk or whatever, and then you can just immediately pay it right off. So to me, it's the same thing. You're going to walk out of the store or you're going to have the same car or you're going to live your life exactly the same. It's just people understand there's more than one way to skin a cat. And that's like why sometimes you go to Lowe's and you use your Lowe's credit card. Even if you have the cash right in your pocket, you, you know that there are just these weird ways of making those purchases just with a slightly better way. And this is the same thing. It's the same concept. It's just different. It's not a credit card. It's a whole life policy. And actually the way I use it, I use the credit cards and the whole life policy. So I don't know if that helps anybody, but if you already can understand it in other ways, like it's nothing new. We've been doing it since the nineties when credit cards started coming out and everybody had all these perks and there was reasons for not just using the cash in your pocket to buy things, doing something first and then paying that. Like it's all, it's all something we already know in one way or another. That's, yeah, I don't I, know if that makes sense to you guys. I'm horrible at speaking, but please let me know if it helped. <laughs> I love it. And people do that all the time. I like how you did that. And just, just to, you know, re-say exactly what Shauna just said. I mean, how many of you, and, and we'll do this live. So, you know, how many of you use your credit, have money in your bank, but yet you go out and you use your credit card to buy things, pay for things, even coffee and things like that. When you got the cash in your pocket, in your wallet, in your bank, but you use the credit card because you know there's some reward, right? You get airline points, maybe you get gas cards, whatever it is. If you use a credit card when you already have cash, can you all put the word A H or I or A Y E? over there. I don't care. I'm just trying to have some fun with this. I or A or however you want to do it. If you're from Canada, you guys can spell it however you guys spell A. There we go. Well, and for me, a really cool thing about it for me personally is, um, you know, my policies aren't big and I'm not using, in, I'm not using it on investments just yet. Um, but I will be in the next few years when they start to like have enough that people, you know, certain deals you have to have, you know, X amount of money to get in. I don't have that yet, but more so than like what to me what's more important than a than a credit card or an air mile is the fact that like I have at the end of the day I do have a death benefit which to me is a lot cooler than anything a credit card could ever provide for me so it's I even if I know we don't really I know we never really do touch on the on the death benefit side of it or the fact that it actually is a whole life insurance policy but to me it's a really cool way of spending your money and use and, and doing all the things you're already doing and having that sort of a perk, you know, tied to you. And just like Catherine said, I have absolutely, since the gas prices have gone up, I make sure that I almost never use my debit card. Like I keep, I keep just like, I shove my debit card away and I'm always using my one credit card that gives me cash back just to sort of combat that extra gas <laughs> price. Love it. And, and, and so if you look at the chat, look at how many people, I, I didn't even get to the top, but how many people use their credit card every month when they have cash in the bank to pay for that credit card and they, they do it to get points or four times the points or whatever it is. You know, and, and then kind of what Shauna said, the, the number one thing I did a YouTube video on this. So write this down, folks. If you have a debit card, rip it up, tear it up, burn it, throw it out. Debit cards are one of the worst possible things that you can use. Now, I know some people argue that. I, I seriously think debit cards are just the devil. Get rid of your debit cards. Use credit cards. But 
every one of you that just said you use a credit card when you have the cash. Imagine if you just changed one thing, folks, where the cash that you just said you have sits. Imagine if that's the only thing you had to do. You just changed where that cash sat that's going to be used to pay off that credit card. Now, everything happens the same. It's the convenience of using a credit card. You get those points, those free airline miles, the four times the points, you get the gas cards, whatever your credit card gives you, you still get all that. But every month, your money is sitting in an account where it's earning an uninterrupted comp or earning uninterrupted compound interest. Imagine then every month or every quarter, depending on how you do it, you just took the money from your bank, your private bank, where it's earning uninterrupted compound interest, you took the money and you paid off the credit card. And then all you did is you just looked at what the credit card would have caught, because I bet you any money, all the people that just said I, I'll bet you not all of you pay that credit card off as planned. Come on, am I right or am I right? Be honest with me. How many of you have the best intentions every month to pay the credit card off, but something or another happens every single month and you just don't get those credit cards paid off. You guys can put something in the chat if you want. I guarantee you, you're all just like me. You have the best intention, but it doesn't always happen that way. Well, another thing with the credit cards too is how many of you sign up for a new credit card and you, I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad, but you, you sign up for a credit card and it comes with a long list of rules and percentages and it even has some things that look like that on there. You, you are already conditioned to just say yes for a credit card, even if you don't understand the fine print. And I know that some of you go through the application process with us in a whole life and you get hung up in the fine print. And I feel like maybe we could just apply the same. We, we know credit cards work. We know it's for our benefit or, you know, as long as you're able to pay it off in time, this is the same way. And so I just want to kind of encourage you guys not to get hung up in the numbers and the fine details when you do, you know, get a policy rolling. Cause we don't, we don't do it for Mr. Visa or Mr. MasterCard either. We don't, we're not calling him in the middle of the night <laughs> exactly. trying to get answers. Yeah. And then Lynette said, the very last comment says, use my credit card, then I pay it off with my policy, with my infinite banking policy. Yeah. So again, remember I said, all we're doing is changing one thing. You all have the intentions to pay your credit cards off, whether you do or you do not. You have cash sitting there and that cash is to be used to pay out the credit card off as long as there's enough. Well, imagine if there was always enough and that money that you have sitting aside that's used to pay off those credit cards never stops earning interest even when all the money's out of the account for the rest of your life. And imagine then someday when we graduate, okay, the day we die, I don't mean high school or college, the day we die, a death benefit gets paid to our beneficiaries. Now, I never talk about death benefit, but Shauna like sparked a nerve. I've been doing this 20 years, folks. And I promise we're gonna get into the numbers. I promise you. So I know some of you are like, get to the point. This is more important than the point. None of you will ever ever understand the reason why life insurance is so important until one day happens. And that day is the day that you get the phone call or the email that one of your clients passed away. And it's just normal business. Okay. In 20 years, I've done this too many times to count. You get the email, somebody passed away, you feel bad. Oh, I can't believe John's gone. Wow. He was so young. And then all of a sudden the death claim comes in and then a check is issued. And back when I was doing this, the check was issued to the agent. So I have this check in an envelope. Let's call it $400,000. Now, whether you think that's a lot of money or not, I then proceed in my car to drive to this family member who I've never met, the spouse, okay, the wife of the, the man who just passed away, my client. And I pull in the driveway and I walk in the house. Okay, I knock on the door and they invite me in. And you can see she's been crying. There's little kids on the couch. I'm like, oh, wow, I didn't know John had little kids this young, you know, and everybody's upset. And you sit down and you begin, you have the envelope and you know, there's $400,000 check in there because John took out a life insurance plan, but he didn't even take it out for the death benefit. John took it out to buy cars and to invest in real estate and do all this stuff. And you sit down with the wife and, and you hear all this stuff. And the wife tells you, you know, she doesn't know how she's going to continue to maintain the house and keep the house. She doesn't know how she's going to keep the cars. She doesn't know how she's going to afford to keep, a, you know, all the things that are needed for her kids, which are in the other room, very upset because they just lost their father. She has no idea what the future holds because John was the breadwinner. John was, John was the one who paid the bills, took care of the finances, made sure he went to work every day, brought home the bacon, if you will. 
John's not bringing the bacon home anymore because John has graduated onto a better place. So I show up with a check in my hand, which is just my job. I don't even think much of it. And I slide the check over and she knows how much it's going to be or give or take. But when she holds that check in her hand, she realizes one thing. Even though John's gone, her life, her children's life, their college tuitions, the house that we're in, the food that's in the cupboards, we'll, we'll continue. We'll continue because of one thing. John wanted to get all the money back for all the cars he ever bought, drove, and owned. That's it. And on top of that awesome thing of getting all the car, the money back for every single car that was out in that driveway, John had a death benefit that he didn't even care about, but he had a death benefit. And now I realized the reason why we do what we do. And it's not because of the cars, the real estate, the cash value, the rates, all this bullshit that you're going to hear us talk about. It's because someday his family gets to maintain their lifestyle because he made one change. Folks, listen, I don't know how else to put it to you. The numbers we're going to look at, the things we're going to do is all good, great, and, and, and indifferent. But none of you will ever understand the power of what we do the way I do until you actually deliver a check to a family who doesn't know what the future holds because they just lost their loved one. So don't humor me, bullshit me, try to tell me that this doesn't work, that doesn't work. I could do better by investing in an IUL or, well, an IUL still has a death benefit. Investing in an index fund, I'm not gonna do this because this the pen, numbers don't pencil. I have lots of words that come to my mind, but the one word is grow the F up and realize there's more to life than what you think because you just want the car, the bigger house and the extra check coming in the door. There's so much more to this. But anyway, back to the regular scheduled program. Let's get into this, Shauna, shall we? Shauna, you're not crying, are you? <laughs> Did we lose everybody? No, they're on there. <laughs> All right. Everybody went really quiet. That was a serious moment that I just kind of broke. Uh, I'm not going to speak on IULs, Christopher. I have a video on IULs. We don't have time to get into that stuff today. All right. So this example that we're going to do up here on the screen, okay, it's not a good one at all. Matter of fact, when I look at this, I cringe because the numbers are nothing like what we do today. But the reason we show this example so much is because it sucks. And because even though it sucks, and even though the rate and the growth and the cash value in the high, the early years is terrible, nothing like what we designed today, it shows you the point that even though this isn't the best policy design, even though this isn't the policies that we use today, it still works pretty freaking good. See, the whole idea here with what we're going to do is we're just gonna put the money that we save. In this case, it's 10 grand. Don't get hung up on the numbers, folks. It's just a number. Yours could be 20 grand. Yours could be 500 a month. Doesn't matter. It's your number, however much you're saving today. So if this person puts 10 grand in, they immediately have access to just under 60% in this. Now, all of you know the plans that we designed today have between 80 and 92%. You've all seen them. You've seen me show examples. So I'm just showing you a bad example. And then this person continues to put money into the policy for a period of three years. Okay. This is money that they were saving already. This is money that was probably sitting in a bank account, going into a 401k, uh, somewhere where, you know, they realized, wow, there's a better place. So they put 30,000 into the plan. So we'll just write that on here. And they want to buy a car in year three. So they're going to buy a $25,000 car. So we have in the account, 25 to 6 to 7, 20, $28,000 or $29,000, okay, 29,204. Uh, now, right off the bat, some people look at this, they're like, wait a second, I put 30 in and I've only got 29 and my money sat there for three years. This is a terrible, and here's what people say, this is a terrible investment. Let's correction, this is not an investment because it's guaranteed, but you know that's how they look at it. So if that's you, then keep watching. Don't go to the bathroom and don't turn this off because right now you are caught up in a big lie. You are believing how you, you are taught money is wor working for you a certain way and you haven't learned the rest. So that's a bad deal by some people because you're down a thousand bucks. So this person takes the loan for 25 grand, buys the car. At the dealership, they decided to look at how much this $25,000 car would have cost to lease and to buy if they financed it for five years. And what they find is it was roughly, and I'm just making a number up, roughly $500 a month or $6,000 a year. And that was a number that they could live with. They are gonna pay $500 a month to somebody else every single month. And all they're gonna do now is they're just gonna change where that $500 a month goes. So they set up a bill pay and the $500 a month goes back into 
their policy or the segregated account, which we'll cover in a second. And then over the next five years, they drive the car, they enjoy the car, they continue to save money because, hey, do, do any of you start saving and then all of a sudden just be like, oh, I'm not going to save anymore? No. If an event happens, maybe you do. But normally when you start a savings program, you just continue doing it. It becomes habit. It becomes second nature. The money just comes out of the account. We don't miss it. It goes somewhere else. This somewhere else here is the machine. The machine is a specially designed whole life. So now after five years, this particular person has driven the car and that car, they've totally, the total amount they've put in is $10,000 for here. Actually, you know what? I'm going to do this different folks. I have a better way to show this. Let's, let's stop this. Let me go one slide further and let's walk through this. So we just got through that part. We bought the car. We decided we were going to pay $500 a month back to our bank instead of somebody else's. So now we've gone seven years into this program. We have capitalized our bank to the tune of $70,000, okay? $10,000 a year for seven years. We then repaid our bank back the same amount we would have paid Bank of America, Wells Fargo, or whoever finances your car, $500 a month, okay? That means over five years, which is normally how long we own a car, you have paid your bank back $30,000. So 70 plus the recaptured $500 is 30. That's $100,000 that we, have re, that we have put into our banking system. But then we bought a car. So if this was any other account, you would have taken the 25 from the 100. So our net injection is $75,000, okay? 75,000 is our true net injection plus a car in the driveway. And remember now we're five years in, the car is bought and paid for. But if we look at our account, our account has $67,881 in it. That is the same as you getting 91 cents back for the first car that you bought using this banking system and you haven't sold the car. So you got 91 cents back for the first car you bought. Now that's not hundred percent, but I don't know if any of you watching or listening to this have ever bought a car and, and really done nothing different, but got 91 cents of every dollar back for that first car you bought. I will tell you, you have not because I've never met a single person that has gotten 91 cents back. Maybe somebody that bought like a collectible classic car, but that would be about it. I think maybe one time in all the speeches I've done. So after five years, we own our first car. We got 91 cents back represented by the 67,000. But the thing is, is you don't just buy one car for the rest of your life, right? Most of you are re-buying a car every five years. You get sick of the old car, it loses that new car smell, the tires, the brakes, everything starts to go on and you're just like, honey, we got to get a new car. So you go to the dealership, one of you, your spouse or yourself, you get in the brand new car and you close the door and it's all over. I, I don't care what any of you say, I've bought in a lot of cars. When you close the door, you get that new car smell and that is it. The car is already sold, you just don't even know it. They make air fresheners that are called air, you know, new car smell. And it's probably the best selling air freshener out there. So don't tell me that's not a thing because it is. So in this year, the eighth year, you're going to buy your second car. But here in this example, you're never going to put another deposit in your bank, which I would tell you would be a huge mistake. And I don't know a single client that ever stopped making deposits to their bank, but we're just going to do it for simplicity of showing you the math. So what we do is in the eighth year, we still have one car bought and paid for in the driveway. I want to be clear about that. You did not sell that first car, but you still got 91 cents back for every dollar you spent on it. The second car you pay 25 grand for. And how you do it is you take a loan from your bank right here. You take a loan from your cash value, which was, you know, the 51 plus the 25. So $76,521 if I'm doing the math right. So you bought the second car by taking a loan from your policy. So you did it the first time at work. Let's do it the second time. You make monthly payments, $500 a month back to your bank, which is your policy. So now let's run the map. From years eight to 12, we never put another dollar back in the banking system. But what we did do is recapture $500 a month back into our bank as a repayment of the loan we took from the policy. We took the loan from the policy and we just recaptured $500 a month, which the 500 a month was the same interest and principal that you would have paid to any finance company or any bank, all right? So now our total injection into the system from years eight to 12 is 30,000, which is the recaptured 500 a month, minus the purchase price of the car, which is 25,000. So we put 5,000 net injection into our banking system. Now, if we did the math and we went back over here to year seven, 
in year seven, we had $67,881 in cash value. Now, I didn't get into the good part yet, but that 67,000 was a combination of number one, the 10,000 in premium deposits, number two, the recaptured 500 a month, and number three, the most powerful thing in the universe, says Albert Einstein, a thing called compound interest. But let me add a word to Albert Einstein's eighth wonder of the world, compound interest, and call it uninterrupted compound interest. You see, even though that person took 25,000 out the first, you know, in year three for the first car, they still got paid interest and dividends on the full 70, even the 25, even though the 25 was taken out. Over here, years eight through 12, we make no deposits into the policy, but we still are earning interest and dividends on the full amount of the cash value. So 70,000 plus the compounding from the first seven years, the entire time, even though we have 50,000 that would have been taken out. So that's the difference. So your policies cash value grew from 67 in this example to 91,000. That's an increase of $23,000 without ever depositing any more money. Uninterrupted compound interest. On top of that, recapturing money you would have given away. So if our net injection was five grand, the, from years eight to 12, and our net injection from years one through seven was 75. What is our total amount that we have put into our banking system over a 12 year period? 75,000 plus 5,000 is what? It's 80,000 bucks, right? $80,000, but if we look up here to the year 12, how much money is in cash value in our policy? $91,000. So we bought two cars and they're bought and paid for sitting in the driveway. Those two cars have value. Maybe it's not 25 grand, maybe it's not even 10 grand, but they have value, okay? But we've gotten all the money back for both of those cars. And all we did is changed one thing and that was where our money went first. And then the second thing that we did is we just, we just agreed to be an honest banker. If you're okay paying Bank of America, Wells Fargo, GM Finance, a monthly payment, why would you not be okay making that same exact monthly payment back to your bank? It just, it doesn't make sense for me to, why anyone would be confused about that. It's just logical. You're okay paying somebody else. You should be okay paying yourself. Because if you owned a bank, there is no way in hell you would borrow money from your bank and not pay your bank back with principal and interest. Your board would fire you if you tried to steal from the bank. Would they not? They would. So when you own your own bank, which is what I'm showing you how to do, you should always be an honest banker and pay your bank back the same amount you would pay somebody else's bank. And if all you did was buy cars for the rest of your existence with this policy, you would get money back, all the money back for every car and then some, because $91,000 is more than 80,000 and you have two cars in the driveway. So what is your real return, folks? Everybody's like, well, the policy only makes five and it, it only makes six and it costs me five to borrow. Well, that doesn't really make any sense. That's the way people's minds think because your minds are broken. Your minds are broken because you've been lied to your whole life. Do the math, folks. Just do it. You put 80,000 in, okay? You now have 91,000. So that's a profit of $11,473, okay? That's not much over 12 years, but how much are those cars worth? So the first car that you paid 25 grand is now 12 years old. How much is that car worth? Can we all agree that maybe 10 grand? Or let's even, let's even say eight grand. So we have an $11,473 profit. Okay, that's from uninterrupted compound interest. Plus, let's just say the first car is worth eight grand and I'm basically giving it away. And let's just say that second car, which is only five years old, has lost 50% of its value. So what would that be? What is 50% of 25? Uh, let, let's, let's put a value on it of, I don't know, two, yeah, thir, let's say 13 grand. I know it's 12, five, but just round up. Joseph, what is the number if you added all those up? Did you do it? I thought he was over there doing that. Has anyone done the math on this? Yeah, sell your car and put it back in. That's smart. So we had 11,000, which was the profit from the uninterrupted, 11,473. Plus I said the first car was worth, what did I say, eight grand? Plus eight grand for the first car. And the second car, we just rounded up to 13,000. So that's $32,473. Okay, 32,473 divided into... I mean, I don't care, should we do it on the full 100, even though that's not fair, because really your net injection was only 80. So let's do it on the 80, okay, divided into $80,000. That's a 40% return. Anyone else getting the math wrong? Or did I get it wrong? Isn't that 
because I got 40.59% return. How many of you would be okay making a guaranteed, almost guaranteed, minus the dividend, but a, a pretty much guaranteed return of 40.5% over a 12 year period cumulative, okay? Because we're just doing a cumulative return and, and getting and having two cars, like now you sold the cars, but would you guys not be okay with that? Because this is the part where I really get confused. This is a terrible example. This is a terrible policy design. This is not a design that we would ever, ever, ever do in today's world. But you see, like, when you focus on the rate in the policy, you are focusing on the absolute wrong thing. Because what I just showed you is exactly what we show everybody. It is exactly how this works. It is the fundamental basis of what this will do. But you can see not much of what I just showed you has anything to do with the rate that the stupid whole life pays you. It has everything to do with how the money works for you every single day. I just showed you a car. Screw the car. Let's say we did that same example, except for instead of buying cars, we lent the money to Joseph or to James here at a rate of 12%. Do you know what those numbers would look like? None of you would believe that they're even real. And none of you would even believe if I showed you the same policy for the third, the fourth, the fifth car. None of you would even believe me there. Matter of fact, Shauna, let's just take a second because these are my cars. All of you can watch this video on YouTube. Now I'm getting fired up because I we, the questions we get, sometimes I just have a very hard time answering them. And no Please. disrespect if it's one of you answer, asking the questions. I just have a hard time. I'm too far down the rabbit hole. It's hard for me to peel back and look at things the way that I used to. Yes, Shauna. You kind of, you kind of brought up something in my mind though too is we don't even really think about I know like my uses for the policy is usually to buy shit uh, you know and like um I never even really kind of thought about the fact that I can sell that stuff like I used it to buy my daughter a go-kart and like and just a better way of doing that like using a credit card getting a little bit cash back you know, being a big girl and having a whole life insurance policy in case anything ever happens to me and all that sort of stuff. And then all said and done, I could sell that thing for a thousand dollars. And, and I, and so now I have a thousand dollars on top of everything else that I just did, or if it's a washer or a dryer or, you know, a whole bunch of, you can go to Raymore and, you know, Raymore Flanagan buy a whole new living room set or kitchen dining set. And eventually you can sell those things too. It's, it's very interesting to me that you just brought up the fact that about the whole gain in selling the car, not only just a way to buy the car, but uh, something we don't really even look at is the fact that you're gonna sell it again probably someday for something too. And that just takes it that much further. Pretty cool. I agree. I mean, I mean, it's just very difficult to really look at this any other way than what I just showed you, which is why that's the example we do. So folks, I just put the YouTube video for the car video. Now this car video that you can see is done with a policy that we would do today. Okay, this one that you're looking at behind me, and it shows the last three cars that I bought. The last three cars that I bought would be this one right here, which is an Audi. Can you maybe zoom this in a little bit, James, so that they can see? So now let me just explain what this is here. Okay, this is these are the these are the different cars. We're going to kind of go through these really quick. The first car I bought was back in 2008. It was a $20,000 A8. Okay. The second car was a Audi S4 Avant, badass car. You'll see a photo of it. And the third car was a vehicle that I bought my wife for her push gift, which is a Porsche Cayenne S. So when we look at all three of these cars, a $20,000 car, used car, a $45,000 used car, and a $63,000 used car. All of them, I calculated the loan interest rates based on the point of the time. So back in 08, the interest rate was 5% through Cornerstone uh, Federal Credit Union. 3% was the car loan on the Audi A8. That was also from Cornerstone. And then this one over here was 4.5%. And that was just a few years ago before interest rates were pulled because of the pandemic. That Porsche we bought was a 4.5% interest rate. Now I know in today's world, we're only thinking about today and you're like, yeah, but I can get car loans for zero. I can get car loans for one, for two. Right you are, Skippy. But you know what? That Skippy day is going to skip right by you this year because they're gonna raise rates, not once, not twice, not four times, probably seven times. Where are your interest rates gonna be? Boom, right there, five, three, four and a half. The days of low interest rates will be gone after 2022 because they have to move interest rates up. Folks can't stay in a low interest rate world for the rest of your life. If you wanna know what that looks like, get your bags packed, sell your house, move your ass to Japan. 
because they have had stagflation for over a decade and that is a problem. It's why they're not doing very well. So this is what your rates will look like. Sorry, here we go. Let's get into it. Oh, actually one other thing I wanna point out here. On this first car, if I had financed this through a regular bank, Cornerstone Federal Credit Union, at the rate it would have been, payment would have been 416, 5,000 a year, Interest I would have paid to them over five years is $2,917, okay? This car, which was that S4 Avant sweet car, 3% interest over five years, payment would have been $875 a month, $10,500 a year. I would have paid the bank $3,806 in interest, interest only. Larissa's Porsche, which we, we ended up selling, you know, because cars are super high, but this car, five-year loan, 4.5%, the payment was eleven or $1,084 a month, $13,000 a year. I would have paid $9,758 in interest. So the total interest that most people out there, the 95 percenters, if I will, that they would have paid to the bank was $16,481. To the math, add them all up. That's how much money you would have given away to buy three cars. And every one of these cars would have depreciated in value. Are we clear about that? Let's go one step further. I decided to do one thing different, change one thing, add one step, however you want to call it. I changed where the money went first. I started a policy for $18,000. Now this policy is a mass mutual policy in all transparency, but I love my One America policy. I don't have a Lafayette policy because I live in a shitty state called New York, but 18,000 is the amount that I was saving. Now, where did the 18,000 come from? Many people are like, well, I don't have 18,000 to save. Well, back when I first started this game, I didn't either. I had 230 a month to save. So how, how was it that I was able to put $1,500 every single month into one of these policies? Folks, over years, I've been saving. I was putting money in 401ks. I just stopped putting money in 401ks and I started putting money here. The amount that I used to save in a Charles Schwab account, I just put, it, put that money here. It wasn't hard for me to save 1500 because I'd been doing this for a while, building this up. So I don't want you all to think that this is where I started. When I started, it was 2003, $230 a month, my very first whole life policy that I ever bought. And it's not even designed right, but I still use it today. I still lend it out. I've lent money to Sean. I've lent money to the companies. I've lent money to everybody from this old, stupid whole life policy that wasn't even built right, which is why I show you that really crappy whole life policy that I started with on that other one. But this isn't a crappy one. This is pretty darn good. See, I put 18,000 in, 10,000 I had. All I did is three years after I funded it, there's my first car. And there's my first car's payments back to myself. Nothing changed except for where I put my savings first. Okay, so we do that. Total amount deposited with the car loan payments, 151,000 over seven years. I bought a $20,000 car, so my net deposit was 131. I just showed you in the last one, we're doing the same thing. The cash value growth after purchases was 116,343. So on this Audi, the first car I bought with this policy, I got 89 cents back of every dollar I paid for that car. That's it. The other one was 90 something. This is 89. Okay. This is my policy, my numbers. So nobody is excited about that. Okay. I just got to drive a pretty nice car for five years and I got 89 cents back for every penny of, of every dollar I paid for that car. But see here in the eighth year, this is a really sweet car. Okay. It was a lowered S4 Avant, black wheels. It was all pimped out. It was a sweet car. Way too fast for a kid when I owned this. So 18,000, eight year. Took a $45,000 loan from my cash value. I repaid myself back the same amount. Okay, so you're just seeing I'm running the map. Total deposit and car loan payments, which is the total amount I put in plus the car loan payments, 120,900. Less the car purchase of 45,000. My net deposit was $75,900. Cash value growth after purchase, $116,718. I got $1.53 back for every dollar I paid for this car. Plus then I sold the car, okay? $1.53 back for every car. This is the second car. Third car. Porsche. I wanna hit on, I wanna hit on that thing we were talking about at the airport the one time too, after you're done. Wait, go, what'd you say, Shauna? When you're done with this third car, I definitely want to hit on this one thing that we were talking about in the airport after, um, 
Oh, when you're for done. sure. For sure. Yeah. So folks stick around with this. It looks like we haven't lost anybody. So stay with us because we got something really good. And can you just zoom that in just a little bit more? So this is a uh, all blacked out Porsche Cayenne S, okay? And the hybrid model, you can see by the blue green rotors. Not yeah, the screen is cars. a little blurry. I know, we got to zoom. He's moving the camera. He's just got to focus it. Can you like autofocus, like tap the little... Uh... He's getting it. There's no autofocus. We got a wide angle. Oh. Is that better? A little clearer, but yeah, that's focus. good. That won't work. You got to... Well, better, I should say. We'll get it there. Hang on. There you go. No. Uh, might be about as good as it gets. All right. So I'll just walk the numbers, but you know, this car, this is 13 years into this policy. Okay. Now I'm not funding it at 18,000 anymore because I'm past the point where I can fund it at 18,000. I'm only putting 7,200 in. Okay. So I take 63,000 from the cash value and I buy my wife a push gift, a Porsche Cayenne. And when I do that, I make monthly payments for the same amount that I would have paid Porsche. And this is the one, if you've ever heard me tell the story where I'm like negotiating back and forth with my friend who's the car salesman about the car. He's going back and forth with the sales manager and the credit manager trying to get me the lowest monthly payment. And it was a fun little thing. And then I finally, he slides the paper across to me and I'm like, oh yeah, that's, that's the number, you know, the 1,083 a month. And I say, I'll take the car. And when, when I say I'll take the car, he gets super excited. And the first stuff he slides over to me is all the finance paperwork for a bank called M&T Bank. And I kindly, I kind of snickle or I, I laugh and Larissa's is laughing too. And I take the paperwork and I slide it back to him and I say, I don't need that. And they say, well, wait a second, you got to finance the car. I said, no, I'm paying cash for the car. And he says, well, why did you have me go back and forth, back and forth with the credit manager? You can see he was a bit frustrated. And I said, because somebody had to figure out how much I have to pay my bank back. That was it. Folks, I had so much fun doing that. And I felt bad that I made him waste that time. But you know what? That's his job. He gets paid a commission for the car sale. His job was to do what I needed to buy this car. His job was to sell the car. My job was to find out how much money I had to pay my bank back every single month. That's a true story. You can ask Larissa about it. So here we go. Total deposits and car loan payments, 101000 So from year 13 to 17, 7,200 a year, that's 36,000. $13,000 car payments every single year, 65. That's six, it's 101,000, less the car purchase, 63 grand, okay? 38,000 net deposit. My cash value over this time frame grew $122,354. That's my cash value growth after the purchase of the car. Larissa's car, and it's gonna be a little off because this is, a, I kept it the full five years, $3.22 back of every dollar I paid for that car, folks. Think about that. You bought your third car and you get $3.22 back for that car that you bought. Interest paid to the bank, zero. Interest paid back to me, $16,481. The exact same amount, 95% of the people out there pay to a traditional bank. All of that money is now in my banking system. And these are the three cars that I got to drive during that period of time. This video is the one I posted in there. Just when you thought you couldn't be any dumber, you go ahead and do something like this and totally redeem yourself. That's how I was feeling when I did this training because everybody told me I was dumb. My best friend said, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Why would anyone do that? I don't know. We only have like 4,600 clients climbing by a few hundred a month. Why would anyone ever do this? Because eventually you find out that you totally redeemed yourself. So that video is the one that I posted on there. All right, let's back that camera out so they don't see the nose hairs up my nose. All right. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I, I, that wasn't part of the plan. I wasn't going to go into that. We actually found those slides. And we're just like, what the hell? Let's show that. So let's, uh, Shauna, let's answer some questions and, and then just go into that thing we talked about at the airport. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I think a couple of them might be talking about if you have like a 0%. Car loan? <laughs> yeah, so um, I was, it was not this time in the airport, but the last time we were in the airport, I was talking about, I like um, this guy named, Richard Rawlings. He was the, one of the hosts of that show, like fast and loud, one of the car shows, I think it's on like A&E or something like that. And I, I follow a lot of his YouTube channels. Um, 
videos and he was taking one of his employees who's like a, a mechanic or whatever. Um, you know, the kid had never bought like a car from a car dealership before. Like maybe he, he got, you know, a car from his dad or something was his first car. And so he was going to be a big boy and have Richard help him at the car dealership. And the cool thing about this video is only like 15 minutes. Um, you know, but Richard's like talking like, oh yeah, you always pay cash for your car and all this sort of stuff. And then he gets in there and he kind of like, you know, he learns that, you know, what, what do we say? It's like, you don't know what you don't know or something like that. But in, in this in this specific instance, because the interest rates are so low with cars, it actually was kind of better for the kid to hold on to his like only savings that he had and just like get the monthly payments for this car because the car payment was a zero percent interest so in that case when you have say i kind of did the i did the math a little bit but say you have forty thousand dollars in your policy and rather than using it to pay for your pay for the car and then you're paying interest and doing all the stuff back and forth to your car what you can do is you could take that forty thousand and you could just lend it out on like in the private money club or something where you're lending it for 12% interest. And if you, I think $40,000, I did the math while we were talking, $40,000, if you lent it at 12% interest, you're making $4,800 a year on that money. Hold on, Sean, is, hold that. Let's put it up on the board here. Just yeah. see visuals. Okay, so if you had $40,000. Yeah, in your policy. And rather than buying the car, because say you get the car, it's easier at the end of the day, you have to be creative too. You don't have to be like, oh, I'm, I'm getting this IBC policy so that I can buy my cars. Sometimes that might look like you're buying your car for 0% interest from somewhere else. So you say you got the car payment, it's easier, the car is easier in this day and age at 0%. It's easier to get it from a traditional person and you just have that payment. What you can do with the money in your policy is you can lend that out and you, you can lend it out for 12% to somebody in the private money club, just like Colleen does to Devin. You lend it at 12% and that's $4,800 a year and that's $400 a month. Now what's now my question to you is what would you do with that $400 a month? Question to me? Yeah, well to everybody, well, but yeah. Some people could take the 12% interest they're earning and then apply the $400 a month to whatever the car payment would be on this $40,000 car, which would pay exactly. more than half of their car payment. Other people would take the $400 a month, roll it back over here. And then, you know, I don't know, there's, there's several different ways to do it. But I think for someone in their 20s or early 30s, where they're looking at this and they, they're caught up in crypto and everything else and making big returns, well, good. Then, then don't buy a 0% car if that's your only goal. Let's, let's do the stuff that you think you can make all that money. Now, if you lose money, don't come back and be mad at us. That's your fault. You didn't protect your wealth. But let's take the $400 a month in gains from your money. We're just using 12%. And a deal just hit Private Money Club that he's offering 15%. There's a deal on Private Money Club that just hit today, 15% interest. First secured position. I'm just just saying. So, man, we're moving off of the 12. So, and then you take that 400 and you pay most of the car payment. Now, if the person had more than 40 loaned out, that that would pay for that entire car. We've got a case study coming soon with Carolina where we're going to do this exact same thing, and we're going to basically pay the full car off. But you know, it wasn't 40 for 40. But let's just assume instead of this person buying a $40,000 car, they buy one that's three years old and they mm -hmm. pay $20,000. Now that $400 a month is pretty much paying for that car payment. Maybe instead of, here's the other cool thing. Well, Lewis brought up a question too. Yeah. You would be paying 5% to the insurance company, which I did the math on that too. I had Andrew help me. It, so of that 400, you'd pay the insurance company 166. So you'd have 234 and add a $20,000 car. I feel like that's pretty close to the car payment. Well, in today's world, I mean, you could always, let's say it's 234, you could always extend out the term six years, yeah. whatever it is. Yeah, you're right at the 166. So I, I left that out on that. But, you know, the, the whole point of the matter is we're just showing there's there's more ways to do this. It's still moving the money and, and making it work for you. And then you just take the 166 and that money goes back to the insurance company. But yep. the one thing uh -huh. that, you know, a lot of people are like, well, they're still, we didn't talk about the other thing. How much money did your $40,000 make while it sat in that policy, even though you took all 40,000 out and loaned it out at 12. Because well, and then you get to sell that car too. Are 5.2 to 6%. I said, it's not about the rate, which I hate showing the rate, but 
I'm just saying that's still more than what it's costing you to borrow the money. And if we do the math on the compound interest, the cash on cash return every year gets to be more and more. So it might only be a 1% spread the first year, the second year or third year, but then after that, it's gonna skyrocket. I mean, some of the cash on cash returns are double digits, triple digits, because every year this money continues to compound. 40,000 times 6% is what? Well, the next year, whatever that number is, let's see six, is that 20 and 40? Is that 42? I'm just trying to do it. <clears throat> but like you said too, at the end of it, like say you sold that twenty thousand dollar car for six grand, you know, at the end, you you loaned out the forty thousand dollars to an investor. They're gonna pay you back. So then you also can kind of be a little foolproof at the whole recycle recapture thing because someone else's it's in somebody else's hands. They're gonna pay you back. You're gonna pay off that forty thousand dollar loan, all while getting that car payment for free, pretty much, and eventually sell the car for six grand. Yeah. I mean, let's just assume I just did 5.2 and I'm just guessing, but it's a little more. If you did that, I can't fit it in there. It'd be the next year you're earning that 5.2% on $42,080, not 40. And the next year it would be whatever 5.2 of 42 is. And every year it's compounding up. So that's the thing people don't understand. They get so caught up in, oh, what about the 5% loan interest? If I borrow from the insurance company, blah, blah, blah. Well, today, actually, this isn't 5% for most companies. It's four, but let's just keep it at five, the high number, because I like going high. If it's five and you're making 5.2 to six, you're making money. And most people would be like, well, if I'm only making five, two, and I got to get back five, that's not even worth my time. Remember the story of John who went and graduated. Don't ever. And I will literally put the boxing gloves on. We'll go bare knuckle. We'll dip our hands in honey and put glass shards on. Like I'll go toe to toe. You really want to have that argument with me. I'm the one that's delivered the claims and helped those families and seen that. Don't ever tell me that's a waste of time. I will hunt your ass down. I'm, I'm literally, I'm going to start creating a hunting club where I'm going to hunt people down and tell me this, this is stupid and doesn't make sense. You guys have all seen the movie. Who was in that ice cube? <laughs> Just kidding. I'm totally joking. But, you know, this is what they get hung up on with the numbers, the rate. They get hung, hung up in the numbers. This is just the first year. Every year, you're compounding. You don't understand compound interest. You have to fully grasp compound interest before this stuff really makes sense. Then after you understand compound interest, none of that makes any bloody difference. It doesn't. It's the process. I showed you the numbers on the cars. I showed you a bags example. We put some videos up for you guys to see. It, it literally, literally will change your life, folks. You don't need to believe me. And, and many people don't. You know who doesn't ever believe me? My best friends, my family members. I tell my family members because they always ask me, oh, what is that stuff you do that everybody's so excited about? I tell them, I give them the videos to watch. None of them watch the video. What, my one aunt called me up and said, hey, um, I need to get life insurance. You know, I got a quote from this guy at, at Northwestern. And, and I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, do you remember that video I sent you to watch? Did you not watch that? Oh, I couldn't find time to watch it. Oh, okay, go, go buy a, a regular whole life from that uh, Northwestern guy. Like that, that's seriously like the shit that I deal with that just drives me mad. So I made a decision just, just yesterday. I literally drew the line in the sand and I'm gonna put it on camera so that I have to live by this the rest of my life. I will never again in my life do business or help any family member or friend that wants to do this, like close friend. So, you know, all of you are my friends, but like, I'm talking like my best friends. Never again will I do business with my friends or my family, period, period. Because for some reason, your friends and your family just will not value what it is I just showed you. I don't understand it. I don't know why, but at a certain point, instead of being stressed out, you just got to draw that line. You just got to say, that's, that's my standpoint. So that's where I'm at. I think we should open it up for some questions. Absolutely. We're Let's at get 90 some minutes in if you guys have any. Um, and this is really just to get ideas going. People people get the concept and bring us and tell us the things that they do with it, which is which is crazy stuff. So um you, you guys will probably come up with something better than what we're saying. Hundred percent. Yeah. So let's get some questions going. And somebody had asked about an IUL. I'm, all I'm going to do is I'm just going to give them the, the video for the IUL just because I'm a giver and I like giving when people ask. So for anyone that was asking about IULs, eat your heart out. Here's the IUL video. We do not use IULs, so you will understand why. 
Um, I, I'm going to read this one question out of the chat. And then if you guys have any questions, just put them in the Q and a, cause it kind of just like pops it over there. Um, but so Fumi says, um, I have questions where premium can be funded from. I assume first payment needs to come from the bank account. Can it be over C if that account name is the same as policy owner and insured and afterwards you can pay premium by credit card so you i don't think you can pay the premium by credit card um the way i paid my premium was just like my checking from my checking account at key bank just put in my routing and checking number yeah it's um you can i think you can do credit cards now with some of the carriers but it's for a very small amount they really frown against that because they know that yeah. it can be detrimental if you don't practice what we preach here. Um, and the other thing with the overseas accounts, you're going to bump into some problems. It, it's probably possible, but there's going to, you're going to really go up against money laundering uh, rules and they're going to want to verify the money there. So it's going to be tough if you're using overseas accounts. And then there is a question. In yeah, there you go. Like Brian said he could use 3000 on his credit card for one America, but not for Lafayette. One, we just spent some time with both companies when we were out at the mastermind. They both showed up. Man, just freaking down for the cause is the best word I'll use. Yeah, so I got a couple of questions. Um, I'm going to hit John's in the chat and then everybody else put it in the Q&A. So are there any certain companies to stay away from or that you recommend? Well, first and foremost, I, if you like this concept that we just taught, then IULs are what you stay away from. IULs are for long-term goals, retirement, things 10 years out when you're beyond the surrender charge. Don't let anyone ever tell you that there's that, that's different. They're, they're, I'm not going to get into it, but IUL companies do not work for this. Uh, other companies that would not work, are, there's too many of them for me to really mention, but like Northwestern Mutual. Northwestern Mutual is, is probably one of the best mutually owned insurance companies. They pay great dividends. They're the strongest financial ratings, but they do not, the company does not support the infinite banking concept because they don't want people taking loans. So the loan interest rate is really high on most Northwestern whole life policies, making it so that they, it just doesn't work. Even though they're a great insurance company, it just doesn't work for this. Um, New York Life, I have seen policy designs that work, but they've never really like been awesome. Uh, one guy sent over, he worked for New York Life, sent over a policy design that was pretty good. Um, but again, New York Life and Northwestern, they just don't support this concept. And I know that as a fact, because I worked for New York Life for 14 years. Um, you gotta be somewhat cautious with uh, direct participating companies. If you're gonna be borrowing direct from the insurance companies, direct participating companies, uh, such as, um, Guardian, uh, Penn Mutual, even though we use both of those companies, but we use them with a cash value line of credit. Those companies, when you take a loan, it will reduce the amount of your dividend by the amount you take from the loan. So kind of like a bank account. If I had 10 grand and I took nine grand out, the bank's only going to pay me interest on a thousand. Well, in a direct participating insurance company, if I start with 10 grand and I take nine grand out, I'm going to be getting crediting. So the crediting rate is going to be based on the remaining amount. And there's a little bit more to it, but that's that's direct participating. And that's a lot of the insurance companies. Um, the ones we use are what are called non-direct. And you guys can research this. You can Google direct versus non-direct participating. I did a video on YouTube. Non-direct, in that same example, if we put 10 in and took nine out, there's only a thousand left, but we're still getting credited on the full 10 because they are not recognizing the loan. That's the difference. Um, outside of that, there's tons of companies. I mean, can I just, I put a post up on the go here for that person that asked that question. I just spent a lot of time writing a post for the infinite banking group on Facebook. So go on the Facebook group and there's a post that I put up there telling all the things you need to basically get with an insurance company and what insurance companies are the best ones to do this with. There's about five of them. And then from there, uh, you know, if you're an agent, then those are the ones you would write with. If you're not an agent, I don't know why in the world you wouldn't just set up a call with us because this is all that we do. And Sean, I'll have you put the link up for anyone that is interested in learning more about this. There's a 90 minute video and then you just set up a call and we'll answer all the questions for you on how this works if you're interested in it. Plus, we are, Brian said earlier, we are the only ones in the industry that have a mapping team that will map out everything that you just saw me demonstrate today. Yeah, he also just was like, "You guys are too nice. Just go to go to us." <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just 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 save yourself the time. I even have we had an agent 
at the uh, mastermind. I'm not going to use the name. And she could write her own policy. And I sent her over all the stuff. I sent her over a video I did on YouTube telling her how to design the policy. She got into the video. She's like, holy shit, this is complicated. Can I just have you guys do my second policy? So she's an agent. She can write her own policy. She's coming back to us to do her second policy because it is that hard and that complicated to design these the right way. I totally forgot about that. Um, on that same thing, Ohio Nashville demutualized. How does that affect existing policies? There's you know, a that's a good question. When, when Ohio National went, um, you know, they demutualized. I don't think the people that have policies are going to be that affected. In the future, it could affect your dividends. Um, but I, I really wouldn't be the expert to speak on that. I don't have a single client with Ohio National, so I just don't know. I'm um, sorry, um, who, whoever said that. I, I just probably wouldn't be the best one to answer that question. Okay. Um, I just put oh, the Ricky, in. Ricky Allen's question. Who do I contact about for the information for the lending at 15%? You just have to go on privatemoneyclub.com and then just become a member and it's right there. It's the first deal that just popped up. I'll actually show it to you guys while we're answering some questions here. Yeah. And <laughs> then again, um, Anonymous said, I get confused with how to use the segregated bank account and the difference between using my regular account. Um, I, I'll just keep it real with what I actually do. I'm not doing big, um, big things. Like maybe I'm doing like 1500 to 2000. If I'm being completely real, I put it in, I have, I have it going to my checking account like that I use for everything, but I'm a very disciplined person. The only reason why we, we suggest a segregated bank account is like when I log into KeyBank, it's got my checking account, it's got my savings account, and I have two credit cards with KeyBank. If I was doing really big transactions or lending was my, was one of my side businesses and all that stuff, I would just have like one more bank account that I would just run my money in and out of. And that way I knew it's not my money for spending on groceries and gas and whatever knickknacks or whatever. Um, but I've, used, you know, $1,500 here and there. And I set up just an automatic bill pay to pay it back. And it just, for me, um, I just let it go in and out of my regular checking account, but that's because I'm a very disciplined person and I definitely would never compromise myself, my own best interest. So, um, a segregated bank account is really just just like an, any other bank account on your list. You log in, it's just another bank account and you just name it bank account B. Yeah. I mean, that's a great explanation. I mean, it's really just books and records. So, you know, the segregated account is not a mandatory thing for the infinite banking concept. It's, I don't know if there's anyone else out there in the industry teaching to use a segregated account, but for us, it really just comes down to, you got to have processes, yeah. right? And it's like Shauna said, I mean, the money from the policy has to go into a bank and has to move out of a bank, which is going to require probably a check okay, or a wire or something like that. So all we're saying is instead of running that through the black hole, which is your regular bank account that you write all your checks from and all your money goes in. And for some reason, ever anyone else had the problem where your regular bank account just always seems to be like the black hole, you know, the wife and the kids get a hold of it and then there's just no money left. So we ended that problem by just going to the bank and opening up a second bank account. And we just call it a segregated bank account because it is yeah. used just for this. All and who's married and has the joint account. And then you have, you know, when you're married, you have the joint account and then you have your each account maybe, but you know, probably usually how it goes, but it's the same as over the weekend. Um, you know, we were joking about arbitrage, arbitrage, and how it just sounds like a fancy word, segregated bank account. This is just another bank account in your already existing thing. You just click a new one or I'm sure you can do it online. Absolutely. Yeah. And Catherine said that she has a, a best friend who has a whole life and wants to sell it. That won't be hard to sell. There will people, there will be people lining up. If she gets the right folks, people will line up to buy that whole life because there's a lot of people out there that are not healthy and they can't get one of these policies. They would die or, or not die, but they would love to buy a policy. And just, just, it's kind of funny. Like my best friend, just let me know. And I, I hate to keep bringing them up, but I'm a little just, just I'm sad for him. I'm upset. I'm mad at myself because I feel like I didn't do a good job of teaching him, but I just had to realize that you, you can't help your friends. He literally canceled a whole life that he has had for nine, 10 years. They would have been fully paid up in the next like three years that had a $250,000 death benefit. And he has two kids and a wife and he canceled it. And he said, that was a terrible place for me to put my money. 
I wanted to reach through the phone and gut him. That's how pissed off I was. I literally, I, I still can't talk to him. And it's not because I'm mad that he got rid of the policy. I don't get anything for that. It doesn't affect me financially. But like if something happens to him tomorrow, he's driving down the throughway and, you know, a guy crosses the line and hits him. His family isn't going to have $250,000. That to me is just tragic. Like, I don't know. Anyway, but it's just sad. And, and you're right, Brian, like we are too nice. Like if you guys want one of these policies, just call us, set up a call, stop jerking around, stop trying to find somebody to do it with. We listen, I'm, I'm going to say something that some of you might not like. We are the best in the industry at what we do. I don't care if you believe it. I don't care if you care. I don't care if I'm being arrogant and saying that. At a certain point in time, you just know that you've gotten to a place where you can say things. And we are the best in the industry at this concept. No ifs, ands, or buts. The only one that was better is Nelson Nash. And Nelson Nash has gone on to a much better place. So I will, I will elect for us to be the next in line to teach this and to help people solve their money problems. So there you have it. I don't mean some people probably are like, all right, I've heard enough of this guy. <laughs> no, what else we got, great. Sean? Um, so Belinda said, I'm confused on the car loan at 0%. If I pay off the loan using my IBC, how does that help me in having more dollars to use to invest? That's and she says, I probably about, need a right? class to slow learn. <laughs> oh, that's okay, Belinda, we love you. Um, it's kind of what we we're just talking about with the 0% loan, depending on how long you've had your policy. So like me, my policies are mature. My policies are old. I mean, I've, I've passed the efficiency zone, which is usually between two and seven years, depending on your plan design. So it, it wouldn't matter for me if I paid off a 0% loan, it would become a cash flow thing. So there's two things you're looking at. You're looking at, does it make sense to pay off a car that's 0%? The simple answer to that is no. But if you had a policy that you've had for eight, nine, 10 years, that is paying you a cash on cash return of 20% and you pay off a 0% loan that is costing you 700 a month. And now that 700 a month goes back to your policy. Now you're making money because of nothing more than uninterrupted compound interest, but you're now recapturing cash flow that you're giving away to another bank. So it might be a zero sum game from an interest rate spread, but you're, you're winning because you're taking the money back in your family that then can be redeployed at a higher rate. But we don't teach paying off 0% car loans just because it, you know, we're, we're speaking to the masses a lot of times. And if we do that, somebody that takes a policy out the first year will pay off a 0% you know, car loan and think that we did, you know, gave them bad advice, which whether it's bad advice or not, it's bad advice in the first couple of years. But after that, it would become really good advice. So that's why Shauna was saying that example of that, that younger guy who, instead of paying the car off, lent the money out at 12% and then took the proceeds from the lending operations and paid for the car. That's a better way to do that. Mm -hmm. And one more question mm -hmm. so far. Um, just Brian says, my daughter is about to head off to college this fall. I know it's not the se sexy topic, but an IBC policy for college seems way more appropriate than an ESA or a 529. Based on the last four months, if I had all the money for her in the 529, I would have just lost 15% when I finally needed it. Hmm. Wow. Brian, you should be a spokesperson. You know, when I was a financial advisor, I sold, I don't even know, probably millions of dollars with the 529 shamelessly because that's what I was told to do. <clears throat> and you're right. Like, think of that family member, you know, that put all this money away for their kids and now all of a sudden their kids graduated from high school, they're going to college the next year, the father's getting ready or the mother's getting ready to take that money out of the 529 and the market drops 15, 20, 30%. The value of that portfolio drops 30%. And now they have to take that money out because that money can only be used to pay for higher education or college. And now they got to take it out at a 30% loss. They'll never recover from that ever. And that's reality. I mean. Listen, we can go through life rolling dice and gambling and, and just betting and hoping, but I prefer to go through life with, with a really clear goal of looking out the front windshield, knowing where I'm going instead of just guessing. You know, when we were driving in Utah from Sundance, I had no idea how to get to the airport. We just punched in coordinates in the GPS. We didn't even need to think. I wasn't paying attention. I'm just about getting us in accidents. And Sean is like, you got to get off right here. You got to get off right here. We knew where to go. Like the directions were right there. It was a guaranteed result at the end if I just followed the stupid things and paid attention. Like, listen, folks, what we're talking about here is a guaranteed result. You will get to your destination. No ifs, ands, or buts. It might take you a little longer, 
Okay, maybe you could have got there faster other ways, but there would have been risks. You might have been able to get there quicker if you went down this road that is notoriously closed in the winter because of ice and avalanches and rocks falling, but it might be 10 minutes faster. Do you really want to take that road in that conversion van that's 20 feet long with front wheel drive and probably inadequate tires and risk it just to save 10 minutes? Or would you just go the way that the GPS told you to go, which was the safe way that put you on salted roads? Listen, we can play this, these games all day long of comparing things you at the end of the day need to decide which path you wanna take. You wanna take the speculative one, the risky one, the index 500 one, because in the past 30 years, it's done this return. So in the next 30, it must have to do that much. You'll never make it. You'll never make it. Trust me, I don't care who you are unless you're Warren Buffett or a hedge fund that has the adequate money. When the market drops 30%, you're going to sell your stocks because of fear, reality, and because of circumstances that happen in recessionary periods. So I don't mean to go into that, but like, Sometimes it's just better to take the slow path, you know, the tortoise versus the hare. We've all heard it. We grew up with those stories. But yeah, you all want to be the hare. Why? The hare lost the race. The tortoise just waddled his way and crossed the finish line first. I'm the tortoise, folks. You are all welcome to be the hare. I'll cross the finish line. You might not. Yeah, uh, one of the quotes this weekend was, inch by inch is a cinch and yard by yard is hard. When you're chasing, you know, those things that's yard by yard and it's hard and it's not necessarily consistent. But if you do the inch by inch, you're going to get where you need to go. Absolutely. So folks, um, David said one really cool thing. He said, my mass mutual agent from my UL policy suggested that I use your services since he really didn't support banking policies. And he said to call and cancel his UL policy. <laughs> oh, wow. So man, that's, that's rare. First off, and that you found yourself a really good one. And you know, a lot of agents come to us. Like, I don't know if anyone knows this, like we help a ton of agents because they just don't have the capacity to do this within their organization. We help them. They send their clients. Yes, we share commissions, even though our commissions are awful. That's why you have so much cash in your plans. It's because we take a serious, serious reduction in our commissions. So what I'm doing real quick, Shauna, just as we wrap up here is I'm trying mm -hmm. to find all the videos that I posted for those two videos. And um, that way you all have them. So I'm going to post the IUL video here. I put the 90 minute video and also folks, the 90 minute video can be found on my website, chrisnoggle.com, or you can go to moneymultiplier.com and watch Brent's 90 minutes. They're the same, uh, just depending on whose face you want to stare at longer. Brent's got some good jokes, I must say. He's got some good jokes up his sleeve. All right. Um, so I'm going to have a meeting with Randy tomorrow to get more information about what Wyoming is actually going to look like. Um, you know, how many people are going to be able to come and all that sort of stuff. So I know that I already saw some emails in my inbox from you guys um, showing interest for the Wyoming trip. Um, definitely email me if you're interested, Shauna at chrisnoggle.com. I will find out more information tomorrow and then I will probably um, let you guys all know maybe Friday or something like that, uh, the next steps. And then um, we have our Ask me anything on YouTube at 4.30 today, um, Eastern. And then there's a calendar link up here in the chat for any of the money mentors. So Gabby, Stephen, Devin, Joseph, any of us um, who are licensed agents can help you out there. Yeah. So if any of you are interested in booking a call, the only mandatory thing we require is that you watch the 90 minute video first. Uh, one cool thing we just did, and you're seeing it circulating, we just came up with a 20 minute video that leads into the 90 minutes. So if you got a, a friend, a family or somebody that you work with that wants to do this, but they just won't watch a 90 minute, we did a really good 20 minute video. So if you want that, let us know. Uh, secondarily, if any of you are interested in any of the events that we mentioned earlier from the next experience mm -hmm. to the three day virtual, just book a call. We're happy to. Or if any of you are interested in the 25, 25, 25, which many of you know about, that was for the private money club there's probably 10 spots left for that and uh outside of there that's a i hope you guys enjoyed that episode we're putting up tons of them but i think if you like this one you'll probably like that video as well click that alert button actually smash that alert button and you'll be notified every time we put a new video so we'll see you on the next episode